Exactly. This is the Daily Tech News Show for Wednesday, December 26th, 2018. From DTNS headquarters in Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Welcome to our listener co-host show. This is the annual episode where we invite some of our supporters, some of our members, some of the DTNS audience folks that we do the show for to come on here and talk to us about what they do and why they like technology and why they listen. Uh, joining us this time, we're very happy to have pianist and composer Justin Coughlin. Justin, thanks for joining us. Hey, glad to be here. Been a big fan uh, since Buzz Out Loud and uh, i5 for the iPhone. So this is, this is very exciting cool. for me. Yeah. All right, good. A, um, um, a, yeah. We go way back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thanks for thanks for uh, for being willing to do this. Also, Michael Parker, who's a purchasing manager at ACD Distribution. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. Hello. And we'll uh, we'll be talking to everybody about what they do, uh, including our other guest, Liam Hughes, senior software developer at Focus Software. Liam, thanks so much. Good day. Glad to be here. Ah, you're in Australia, are you? <laughs> I am. So it's December. What gave it away, Tom? For you. Yes, I'm in the future. Yeah. We're all kind of in the future <laughs> in a way, but you're even more in the future. Yes. Um, well, thank you guys for, so much. Uh, I know there are so many people who respond every year who want to be on this show, and we really appreciate all that response. And I always wish we could just have everybody, uh, but but for reasons of listenability and production resources and whatever, uh, we have to limit it to three. And I think we picked three folks who can represent some interesting viewpoints. And if you didn't get picked to be on the show this year, keep keep asking, keep keep trying, keep looking for those announcements. Um, we'll start by, by talking to Justin. So you're not just a pianist and composer, you're also a touring musician and educator. Um, and, and you also can't see, uh, yeah. you're blind, right? That is right. Totally blind. Um, and, uh, that's, that's pretty much my story. <laughs> <laughs> I told it all for you. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Oh, no worries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess just a little bit of background on where I'm coming from is, um, yeah, I play jazz piano. Don't hold that against me. Um, I love jazz, <laughs> but that's all right. <laughs> uh, like, you know, all kinds of music. But as a jazz pianist, I think for a long time, my aspirations were pretty low. Uh, but a crazy thing happened about uh, almost 10 years ago. A buddy of mine decided he wanted to make a a film about our, one of our teachers, a guy named Clark Terry. And he wanted to film, he filmed for about four years and threw me in the mix as one of Clark's students. And after the four years, they, they actually made this movie. Crazy thing happened. Um, is that through the filming of the movie, we met Clark's first student who was Quincy Jones from the 50s. <gasps> wow. Oh, wow. Um, so the movie gets made and it gets out there. And um, ever since meeting Qu um, Quincy, I've been working with him. And no. uh, that's kind of, cause you know, as a jazz pianist, my goal was to be a good local musician back in Virginia, but now I'm living out in the LA area. And um, when I'm home, I'm here with my guide dog, Candy. Aww. And when I'm on the road, uh, accessible tech is extremely helpful. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the tech you use uh, to, to get by in your day, bo both at home and on the road. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I probably would start to say that um, just technology in general, it, it for me and my experience of it is split into two parts before the iPhone 3GS and after. Mm. Um the 3GS is when Apple introduced VoiceOver, the screen reader for the iPhone. And that was groundbreaking because first of all, I didn't think I would ever use a touch screen, hmm. but they created an interface where basically I drag my finger across the screen. It tells me what's there. And not only do I know what's there, but I know where it is, which is a new thing for a blind user. Um, and the other thing was that I could actually have something that was cool. <laughs> like an iPhone. Before then, you know, blind tech was always quite old, very expensive, and, you know, um, definitely not cool. So the iPhone is this Swiss Army knife of very useful tools. Um, so when I'm on the road, um, I'm, you know, hotels are always different. So FaceTime for me is a godsend because I call somebody back at home who I trust. And we walk through the room and they, they tell me where the thermostat is. 
I set the thermostat. Oh, they, we wow. go into the bathroom and I find out which one of the four identically shaped bottles is the shampoo and the conditioner. <laughs> Because I don't want to wash my body with conditioner. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so that's that was big, uh, being able to use that to get sighted assistance remotely. And then um, PayPal and Venmo, of course, everybody uses them. But for me, as a band leader, um, this eliminates the stress that I used to have with, like, um, do I have to write checks for, for my band members? And I don't really want somebody else writing the checks for me. Um, you know, I don't want them giving themselves more money than I want them to. So PayPal just simplifies everything. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm using the same tech and the same apps as everybody else, but it's, it's in a different been, way. Yeah. It's been extremely. Justin, here's a question I have for you is yeah. um, because we try to cover assistive technology as much as possible um, mm -hmm. on the show, because it's important. You know, most recently we, we covered the idea of uh, Instagram, uh, yeah. Photos having, uh, you know, it read out loud descriptions, mm -hmm. um, either by AI or or if a user submitted it. How much are some of these technologies really lacking for somebody who's 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 actually living and breathing this? I, I'm I'm glad to see any developments. Um, I'll say when Facebook rolled out their AI described pictures, it wasn't too exciting. So when AI does it, you, you, I'll, I'll see that somebody posted a picture and it'll say, um, so-and-so is in the picture. And I'm like, well, that's cool, but also not terribly helpful or descriptive. Right, um, the context is lacking. If, if a user is able to go in and actually enter in text to, to, to really paint a picture for the blind user, um, that is, is cool. And of course, if AI gets better, then we might have more substantial things coming from that. Um, but it's all it's all baby steps. I'm just happy to see any any progress. That's that's always exciting, and and to have it covered in any any news <laughs> platform is is just always good to see. Yeah. I like seeing I liked seeing the Microsoft story that you guys reported on about the closed captioning uh, in real time, because mm -hmm. um, all this stuff helps. And Microsoft actually has been doing a great job. Um, they've rolled out Soundscape, which is a GPS app. It's free. It's, you know, I, I've downloaded on the iPhone, and they've also rolled out another app called Seeing AI, and you know that reads currency, so I actually know what dollar bills I have, oh, yeah. and um, so it's just good to see things being rolled out by the major companies, not by like a specialized blindness um, tech company, which is good too, but sure. it's it's even yeah. better when it's mainstream because then you know I feel included. Now, I, I know that, that, that Roger said that you had a question you wanted to ask us about. <laughs> yeah, I've just been curious. I've been, you know, watching these or listening to these podcasts for a long time. I'm curious what if somebody's watching the video, what do they see? Uh, like, is it is it like Brady Bunch? Is it that kind of thing? Is it square Hollywood squares or? It, well, it's not unlike that, okay. I suppose. I mean, if you're talking about the Google Hangouts experience, mm -hmm. um, I mean, as far as Tom and Roger and I go and, you know, all of our um, uh, regular contributors, we all kind of have our, our little backgrounds. Certainly at my house, you'll see a dog and two cats walking around behind me very right. regularly. Um, you know, at Roger's house, his daughter <laughs> maybe makes an appearance every so often. Tom, Tom's pretty good about <laughs> yeah. keeping all, all his, uh, his furry friends away, but... Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a really, that's an interesting question um, well, because of course we know a lot of people listen to our audio show, but don't watch it, but mm -hmm. if you could never watch it, mm -hmm. you know, what Just does it look yeah. like? Cause you know, I go back to, um, you know, I, I listened to buzz out loud and I just imagined a round table and I don't even know mm -hmm. if that's correct, but you know, cause you, you, you hear things and you just paint a picture automatically in your mind, but yeah, it was just something that I had, I, wondered about yeah, so <laughs> the video see? automatically switches it's full screen for each one of us so it's not like Brady oh, Bunch in that way. okay so okay each one of us is on screen as we're talking hangouts will yeah. automatically switch to the person that's talking and then down in the bottom we have little chiclets where we can sort of see the other person's camera everyone so that, hanging so like right yeah. now it's like one two three four five seven of us yeah because there's two chilling rivals. down there yeah <laughs> got it yeah. so it's mostly full screen though 
Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Well, let, let's uh, let's talk to Michael a little bit. Uh, Michael's a purchasing manager for a distributor of hobby toys and games. Uh, Michael, what what kind of content? What is it? Is it tabletop RPG? All of that kind of stuff? Yeah. So um, we focus on uh, on analog hobby games uh, and toys. So uh, we service uh, a lot of uh, independent retailers. So, uh, you know, in the LA area, there's, you know, like Gamescape or up in the San Francisco Bay area, there's a number end game out in Oakland, as well as uh, Gamescape in San Francisco and San Rafael. So these independent retailers are getting um, product, Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, other role-playing games, other board games, miniatures games, hobby supplies, uh, all of these things. And the majority of them are purchasing uh, uh from distributors or directly from the manufacturer, uh, depending on their relationship or how big they are. Like a lot of these small independent specialty stores don't necessarily want to have a relationship with, you know, 50 to 60 different manufacturers that might be their top sellers. So they'll work with distributors who aggregate the, that content down and, uh, uh, you know, combine shipments to, to make shipping more reasonable and justifiable and things like that. And that's a lot of what so I am on the not sales end. I'm on the purchasing end. So I work with the manufacturers to bring in inventory to our warehouses. And then our sales team takes that inventory and resells it back to those retailers. So the hobby shop buys from the distributor because that, that makes it a little cheaper to get a lot of things at once. And you're the guy that makes sure the things are on the shelves when they order them. Correct. Okay. Let's make sure I got that right. Yep. Um, so, so what kind of technology do you use? I'm sure you use a lot. I mean, we, we talk about logistics quite a bit on the show. So the interesting thing that I thought that I could kind of share was just kind of, um, particularly when you talk about like Amazon or some of these really big players kind of in the supply management space. Uh, Amazon obviously operates a number of warehouses that are both direct to consumer as well as they operate their services platform. A lot of the technology that they're uh, that they're starting to develop, you know, is, is, you know, probably years to a decade down the line for what we could start using. So a lot of what, a lot of what we're using is, is a little bit more designed specifically for kind of our, you know, the cottage industry that I kind of operate in. Um, so from a, from a purely technological perspective, a lot of like we're using modern warehousing techniques and things like that, but a lot of what, what we do kind of from a supply chain management is we're really excited about some of these developments that we're going to start seeing down the line, uh, particularly when you're talking about being able to, you know, verify shipments through blockchain or getting a better, uh, uh, you know, getting better analytics as far as kind of how our delivery schedule works, because a lot of that is stuff that we're still needing to do manually. And when you're talking about, you know, games and toys and books and things like that, a lot of those industries are, you know, stretched back into a lot of the pre-internet days. So, we're working with, uh, and particularly us as a distributor who works with a, a large volume of manufacturers, we're dealing with wide variances of technological level infrastructure within those manufacturers. And then we need to kind of translate that into, you know, how that's coming across in our system. And ultimately to be able to give the retailers and the retailers, the end consumers, the information about, well, I want X product, I want X game, or I want X book, or I want these toys, you know, when are we going to get that managing that information flow? You you sound like the kind of person that people would assume would be worried about automation eliminating your job. Do you, do you feel like machine learning and AI is just going to make your job better, or are you worried about eventually someday, uh oh, they won't need me? Um, in I am not as worried about that uh, specifically with automation. I mean, I'm I'm looking forward to automation coming in and taking pieces of my job away that I have to do manually. I I, I long for the day that I can make certain elements of my workflow easier. So, but uh, there are definitely things I think in the supply chain that are going to be, that are going to be automated out of the human intervention. Um, and I'm not necessarily worried about those. And specifically in kind of our, in, in my industry, a lot of it is, is user taste. I mean, I, uh, similar things you would see in, you know, kind of like uh, book publishing or fashion or things where the end consumer preferences are very high uh, you know, influence the mar uh, the the market quite a bit. Um, you're still going to have kind of tastemakers or or gatekeepers that that try and distill information from kind of early in the supply chain process to anticipate what is going to be popular within consumers down the line. Yeah, I feel like that sounds like the kind of thing that AI is good for in medics medicine, right? In medicine, you don't re get rid of the doctor. The AI helps the doctor diagnose by suggesting things. I feel like AI could help suggest things to look at to 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 capture those early tastemaker 
situations, but yeah. you still need the human touch in there. Absolutely. So one of the things that we've, one of the tools that we've used is we've used uh, inventory analytics software that kind of helps, you know, grade products along, you know, with, with varying criteria and then throws up, you know, basically infographics or metrics to, to say, here are the number of products that you have in these categories and these categories. These are the ones that have this level of high velocity versus these are low velocity. And you can, you know, start using that information intelligently to say, well, I now have uh, you know, these that uh, are in an accelerated curve for what I need to purchase. Maybe I need to go look at ordering more or these have slowed down. Maybe I need to look at my start divesting myself of inventory or or not worrying about restocking that particular line. Uh, so we've we've used a lot. We've used toy. Uh, 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 a lot of that, particularly in the toy market, which is is somewhat new for for my company, we've we've grown into that space in the last couple of years, working with those toy stores, which is um, all new for us. So we're taking a lot of that type of uh, metrics information a lot more seriously as we need to react quicker because we don't necessarily have the in-house expertise uh, uh, at, to have a baseline of the product as much as we have with the things we've carried for decades, like you know board games and card games and things like that. You know, Michael, you mentioned Amazon a few minutes ago and the idea of, you know, uh, obviously your company has 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 gone above and beyond trying to, you know, figure out how to, how to best sell to to your audience. But let's say uh, you were a little bit newer to the market. Um, how much does that that sort of big conglomerate perhaps help uh, a, a smaller seller that might not have the exposure and the reach otherwise versus hurt it. So from one of the things that we've seen trending wise just over the last several years is that things like uh, the Amazon marketplace and Kickstarter have really opened up the potential for a lot of independent creators. I mean, in the same way that it's done for a lot of a, a lot of industries uh, where getting to the end, getting directly to the end consumer has never been easier. So we see that there's a lot of a lot of product getting out into the market that you know maybe it doesn't actually need a a lifespan in distribution but you know this person who's creating you know uh, you know, a handful of games on Kickstarter can fulfill those directly to, you know, his audience or, you know, and maybe he sells the remainder to, to, you know, on the Amazon marketplace. I mean, uh, Justin uh, talks all the time about how, you know, him, his games, you know, are, can be found on uh, Amazon. And for, for him and his audience, that's, you know, a perfectly uh, uh, reasonable and logical place for him to, to sell his products. Uh, not uh, there's, there's such a wide option for, for products, particularly for for retailers, both online as well as uh, brick and mortar stores, that uh, not everything needs to necessarily be in a brick and mortar store. Um, and what we see is that there's kind of a, a small divide between these publishers that kind of are able to kind of focus on their niche within the niche within the market, as well as uh, you know people who are still kind of operating off of the pr traditional publishing model, where you know a bigger publisher kind of takes it, does a large uh, large print run, brings uh, brings inventory, and then sells directly to their direct accounts, big box stores, uh, as well as you know into distribution or directly to those kind of smaller independent stores. So you're you're kind of in between. There's there's the direct through Amazon approach, and there's the direct from the manufacturer approach. Uh, do you do you see that there's a good future for that that middle approach that that sort of helps connect the dots? Yeah, I mean, and I th I think overall, as kind of the the market itself kind of grows, um, just with these other uh, avenues and you know technology kind of helping these other avenues basically support themselves, maintain themselves, right? Um, the other thing that we're seeing is, is that uh, communities for end consumers are are growing. Um, uh, every year, there's more and more like uh, local conventions for mm -hmm. for for hobby games and you know just nerd culture in general. Um, that uh, uh, you know uh, games are a part of that that culture for a large number of of those communities, uh, and uh, the the technology that kind of helps support those those communities and those networks mean that there is still opportunities for people who are either at conventions or supporting them or supporting local communities through their local shops. Um, uh, the I, Before working in distribution, I managed a retail store in the San Francisco Bay Area for a number of years. And one of the models that we focused on was focused on kind of the Starbucks third space model, mm -hmm. where you, you, have, you have work, you have home, and then you have a place where that's your community center. And for a lot of people who are enthusiasts for, for hobby products, you know, that game store is that third space where... Um, in addition to obviously offering the the retail 
uh, component of it. Um, there's the community that's managed, whether they're playing in store or they're just, you know, using the store as a springboard to play elsewhere or, you know, form local uh, home groups out of that type of uh, situation and, you know, uh, uh, developments in social media and being able to kind of manage communities has has only enhanced that ability for for a retailer to be able to kind of curate their communities and, and engage with them better in the same way that a content creator would. Well, let's uh, let's get to Liam, who has been patiently waiting, uh, always patiently waiting for the rest of the world to be in the same day, uh, but and also <laughs> waiting for things like the U.S. to to get tap to pay. Uh, Liam Hughes, senior software developer at Focus Software, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into app development. Uh, so, from the earliest time I can remember, <clears throat> I've. Um, wanted to be a computer programmer. Um, my dad introduced us to computers very early. Uh, and um, basically when, when it came time for me to go to university, I went and did computer science. Um, had a bit of a diversion for a little bit, but uh, uh, including doing some consulting with IBM. Um, but uh, I've been here at Focus now for about six years uh, doing web-based application development. And did you use any particular technology to help find work to, to help get your job? Uh, pretty standard, really. Uh, job board. Um, went on a job site. Uh, my contract with IBM was coming to a close, so I just went online and found this application development job in country New South Wales, which is rare, but I was very excited at the opportunity. So, okay, so, 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 Liam, my question to you is, how many folks do you... Um, do you uh, uh, deal with, um, work with on an everyday basis that are, you don't see? That I don't that you're see. Not, you're not in the, you know, the, same, the same hemisphere with. Yeah, so I mean, uh, for our company, we have uh, sales and customer support in the UK, the US and Australia, but all the software development is done here in Orange. Um, so my team of about 12, uh, we have some uh, contact with our, our customer service staff, um, for sure. Uh, but a lot of that is uh, obviously asynchronous um, with time zones. Uh, so we use um, email and Jira. Uh, but yeah, the, the core team is here in Orange. How long have you been doing app development for again? Uh, yeah, so I guess about seven years all up. I had a crack at iPhone development. Um, but uh, the, the sales didn't take off. It was a great learning experience, though, uh, and I did a, a bit of contract work, but, uh, yeah, full-time for yeah, about six years. It feels like your area of software development has been fairly stable uh, from the outside, right? Um, whereas, whereas, like you say, iPhone app development kind of you know has its rises and falls. It's getting more stable now, too. Does it feel that way from the inside or, or, or would you dispute that notion? Yeah, no, I mean, I guess for us, uh, we, as a company, we've had the subscription model for a very long time before it was, uh, I think, popular. Uh, so uh, we've kind of had, we haven't always had to worry about big splashy releases. As long as we're consistently uh, providing value to our customers, then they stick around and we are able to keep working away at our uh, applications. Is there a dream application that you you would like to work on one day? Uh, I used to have lots of lots of <laughs> lots of <laughs> yeah, oh, after your IBM experience, you're like oh. uh, when I uh, I mean uh, family life takes up a lot of my time, so I don't have a lot yeah, of time yeah, for uh, side jobs at the moment. I've got a, uh, a notebook full in my Evernote of different ideas, but uh, nothing that stands out. <laughs> well, and Roger said that you had a question for us. Um, yeah, I, I guess a few years ago, I got back into reading, uh, partially because I wanted to do the whole no screen time before sleep thing. Um, I know Tom reads a book or two. Um, I was just wondering if for each of you, if there was one book that uh, would be your absolute favorite or perhaps one book that you have learned the most from. Ooh, uh, well, if we're talking about fiction, and this one's a little obvious, but um, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is my absolute favorite book. I've read it like a hundred times. Wow. Um, it's just the funniest thing I've ever read in my life. Movie, not so funny, 
didn't work. It just didn't translate, in my opinion. Um, but that would be my favorite book um, that I uh, I still have. Like it's like a very weathered paperback um, that's under my TV right now. But um, otherwise, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, Tom and Roger, please weigh in. Uh, um, I, I I'll confess to uh, rereading Dune. On my okay. Kindle, because that was one of the first things I got. Unfortunately, I had is a lot of uh, typos because I think they just did an OCR of the uh, the actual book. But it was one of the first books that I read, not as a kid, but like a teenager, uh, where you know, allegory, you know, the the whole allegory of the book and and stuff was uh, such a such an important cornerstone of the entire what would be the series, although I've only read the first book. But uh, I've always enjoyed it because it, um, both uh, as literature, but also because one of the biggest, fattest books I've ever willingly sat through and read and not like kind of just like, I don't ever want to do this again. So it was, it's, it's, it's one of those things. Uh, unfortunately, the past two years, ever since actually I moved down to LA, I actually haven't had that much time because like you, I have, I have uh, kids that uh, cry for my attention constantly and and it doesn't it's not conducive at all to to reading the printed page well i i've mentioned this a million times uh but for those who haven't heard the man in the high castle by philip k dick is kind of my favorite book of all time uh just because i'm i'm a big fan of alternate history and what could be and differences and 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 it's set in the 60s you know so it's it's got that retro flavor to it um I, as far as the book that i've learned the most from would would be hard for me to pin down. Uh, I, I was very influenced by uh, the Clue Train Manifesto, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People for All Things, yep. Getting Things Done. Uh, those, those have all kind of contributed to the way I put things together, but I don't know if there's one book that I've learned the most from. I, I feel like it's just kind of get pieces like the Tao Te Ching and, and everything just adds a little something as you go along, I, it's a hard one for me to answer. In that yeah, way. I um, I I might be the minority, but I don't read a lot of nonfiction. Um, and it's not because I don't enjoy it; it's because I feel like I kind of live that. <laughs> so when I when I kind of sit down and want to escape, I want it to be into a you know another world. So all of the books that I love the most and are and, you know dearest to my heart. Are, are, are fiction. Um, and that's <laughs> my own sort of escapism thing going on. But I, 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 I'm sure a lot of people share that sentiment with me. I'm actually sure. curious if Justin or Michael have an answer to this question as far as a, a favorite book. Man, I think it's whatever I'm um, currently reading, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's all, you, you, you only read a book that's better than the last one. That's it's I like, like I, I probably that. I probably revisit um Terry Pratchett's books like okay. pretty frequently. Um as a I've read them all, so going to bed that 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 that's a fun one. Um that's a lot of them too. So yeah, you've got a you've got a whole universe <laughs> to choose from there. There's what 30 some plus yeah. books, I think. Yeah, and I assume those are you're listening to the audiobooks for Audible. that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, the, the audio reader for, for uh, the Terry Pratchett books is fantastic. I could not read those in print because I didn't understand the joke until it was read to me with a British accent. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Michael, do you have an answer to your favorite book? Uh, the If we're talking about the most influential book on me, it's probably uh, Roger Zelazny's Chronicles of Amber series. Uh, I reread that series probably once, once a year-ish. Um, as far as one that I've actually like learned the most from, I read a book in college by Simon Sinek called "Start with Why," uh, and it was a it was an interesting book about. Um, it, it's kind of about the process of uh, why we engage with brands as kind of a a kind of a meta term, and it, mm. it talks about um, Walmart and Apple and and things of that nature. But it talks about you know kind of how you know, what speaks to us about brand loyalty to a certain degree, why someone is, you know, always going to use an Apple product because they like the, you know, not just because of the aesthetic or the functionality, but, you know, what that brand might mean to them on, you know, on a personal level. And it was very interesting just to kind of think about how that, how that affects our culture from a mindshare perspective.
Liam, I, I want to turn your question around back to you. I, I'm curious what your answer would be to your own question. I realized about 10 minutes ago that you might ask that. Um, <laughs> so I guess for fiction, uh, definitely into the science fiction. Um, uh, when I, yeah, like I said, having not read for many years, I, when I got back into it, I started with, I think it was Ender's Game, which mm -hmm. I managed to avoid the spoiler too. So that was uh, definitely gripped me and I stay up too late reading that a lot. Um, I uh, actually, uh, as a Christian, I read the Bible a lot. Sure. Um, and then for nonfiction, uh, predictably irrational has changed the way I think about uh, how we think hmm. um, and that we're not always aware of why we do what we do. That's great. Um, I'm curious before we wrap up here, if, if you guys have any questions for each other, now that you've sort of gotten to hear each other's stories, uh, I know that's sort of an awkward thing to throw out there sometimes, so you, you may not. But don't feel, don't be afraid to to throw out a question if you've got one right now. <laughs> this is that part at the like at the end of a conference. Yes. You ask yeah. if anyone has any uh, questions. Like, and no. We're trying not to put you on the spot, but you sort of yeah. let, let me ask there. let me ask Justin this. Okay, because you work with Quincy Jones, mm -hmm. yeah. sure you have some idea of of his of of that of him as a as a person are there are there any memorable moments that you could share that wouldn't get in, in get any anyone in trouble <laughs> well, i'm just curious you know <laughs> one thing that's worth mentioning and i had mentioned it to you earlier roger but um you know when the when the articles came out i'm not i'm not one that that likes to i don't interact a whole lot with you know whatever um but the, when you guys actually covered it when uh a these these articles came at the interviews with Quincy, and um, you know people. I think the internet was like, "Is he crazy?" or Whatever, yeah. and it's like, and when I when I read it, I loved it because it really did capture what it's like to sit down and have a like a relaxed conversation with him. But when it was written in print, all of the things that contextualize what he was saying made it made it seem so so much kind of more, I guess sensational nonsensical and yeah. well but it's, but it's the yeah difference between email and talking to someone right i mean how many times do we run in in every day where we say something in email or we say something in slack even mm -hmm. and people are like, react in a way they're like oh no i didn't mean that because it's written the, the written word always plays well, and it, you know i mean tom and roger and i talk all day every day and mm -hmm. we do that constantly where i'm like well, all right and tom's yeah. like no 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 i didn't mean it but you know, or, I would, or you know that it, it's there is something lost mm -hmm. um when you're not um you know face to face so to i'll speak. say he is an incredible human being um and uh one memory that the thing that pops into my men my mind um the first thing was one of the first times i was at his house it was um we were hanging in his living room and it's him uh, Candy's with me and his daughters, Rashida and Kidada. And um, Candy, she's a black lab, so she's a real lover. And mm. we're all pretty much on the floor, you know, uh, just hanging and they're petting Candy. And Candy was just like sprawled out, you know. Um, one paw was on Rashida's leg, the other one is on Kidada. And Quincy was just like, oh my gosh, you know, like Candy. <laughs> oh my goodness he was just so taken aback by how comfortable candy was and, <laughs> and and pretty much ever since then i think um my name has become candy man and that could be very embarrassing oh, in like in in public because yeah, i'll be doing a performance and if he makes an appearance and he shows up and he goes you know from the audience candy man and I'm like, stop, <laughs> stop saying that <laughs> he's the best though we love him yeah well he, it's one of those things where like nobody else understands why he's saying that unless they've now heard you tell the story right? so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. uh well any other questions at all even questions for us that you guys have nope. gotta um, say i love i i love what you guys do i love the format that you guys created and um as as somebody, I think you know, as, as somebody who's a part of the Patreon group, it's uh, you do a fantastic job of um, creating. I think what is the ideal situation with the Patreon format, which is where like I, you know, it's an engaged audience, and um, I'm also very glad to see 
um, how you guys are constantly thinking of new ideas. It makes it very interesting to be involved, you know, in the Patreon thing. So oh, thanks. Yeah. Definitely kudos yeah, on that. That's so nice to hear. Yeah, we try we try to keep keep coming up with new things so we don't fall in a rut. <laughs> <laughs> keep it spicy. For sure. It's funny. Um, my other question is about an old thing is um pick of the day. I used to love pick of the day. Um <laughs> you're the one. <laughs> I'm the one. Am I the only one? <laughs> uh no, it's not quite that bad, but pick of the day was definitely a thing that a few people really liked. And yeah. the rest of the audience, nah, not it's not that they didn't like it. It was just when we kind of stopped it doing it, yeah. nobody really complained. <laughs> um so so and and it was it was one of those things where it took more work than than it was getting back. So we sort of it pick of the day still exists just through email, right? Like if you have a pick or a cool thing, you can send it to email and Sarah will read it in the mailbag. And so we that way we don't have to force it to happen because it's a segment every day. Yep. I, I I did enjoy that just kind of reiterating that just because it pointed me to a lot of things that I would not thought that I would have needed to go explore, right? Uh, where it it brought something to top of mind that I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. And even if I just looked at it, and I was like, oh, that doesn't quite do what I was thinking it was doing based on the you know the one line description. It was kind of a neat feature, just as yeah. food for thought. Maybe what we could do it's because I don't want to have to force it every day because then it starts to to get it gets watered down. But maybe when mm -hmm. someone sends us a pick, we could call it out more as like, oh, it's a it's a patron pick, you know. And that might encourage more people to send them. And, and you still get that benefit of, of being introduced to some things that you wouldn't otherwise know about. And encourage people to sign up for the Patreon. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All at the same time. Well, thanks, you guys, uh, all for, for joining us. Uh, let's go around the horn and tell folks uh, uh, what you want them to know about you, if it's where they can follow you on Twitter or a website or, or anything. We'll start with you, Justin. Uh, where can folks, phone, folks find out more about you? You can find me on my website. It's just www.justincoughlin.com. And uh, my Twitter is pretty sad. <laughs> I, I try to uh, keep it updated or be engaged, but it's not my favorite platform. Um, things that are going on. I have two CDs that, that came out um, in the last year. One is called Coming Home. It's produced by Quincy. And it's, it's a bunch of originals and, and some covers. I did a Sufjan Stevens cover oh, cool. um, called John My Beloved, and then uh -huh. we covered Strawberry Fields. And then for the holidays, I also made a CD called Silent Night, which is a solo piano. And it's more, it's, uh, it's quite Catholic, I would mm -hmm. say, in that it's kind of sad. <laughs> <laughs> but I like to say it's contemplative. Well, and mm -hmm. uh, so I, I explore some older hymns and um, it's definitely more of a quiet, it's not a Michael Buble Christmas. Um, so those are there. And then the film, uh, Keep On Keeping On, is the one that uh, featured myself. And I do make a cameo in Quincy's. Oh, so very cool. you can see me there. Keep your eyes open <laughs> for that, too. <laughs> it's justincoughlin.com, K-A-U-F-L-I-N, if anyone's yes. trying to, to remember it, uh, justincoughlin.com. Michael, what about you? Where can people find more of what you could do? Uh, well, similarly to Justin, my Twitter is mostly a place where I lurk, but if someone wanted to uh, follow me on my very occasional post or wanted to reach out and, and chat games with me or uh, whatnot, it's uh, mparker546 uh, is my Twitter, and uh, I post there mostly when I'm at game conventions and see cool things. Cool. Excellent. Uh, check it out, mparker546. And of course, uh, Liam, tell us not only what's going on at Focus Software, but anything else about yourself that you want folks to know. Yeah, for sure. I should uh, put a plug in for focus. Um, it's funny when Michael was talking about his analytics of um, inventory and uh, uh, velocity of sales and all that sort of thing. That's what my uh, company software does uh, for inventory, uh, retail, manufacturing, mm -hmm. all that sales, all that stuff. So definitely uh, check that out if uh, you're involved in any of those sort of things. Um, you can check out my website. Uh, it's pretty bare, but leanfuse.com. It includes a link to the Focus website and my Twitter where I don't post anything. Uh, but uh, you can send me a message if you want to know anything else. Well, thanks to these folks and everybody who supports us on Patreon, patreon.com slash DTNS, uh, allowing us to continue to do the show. Of course, our, our goal every month, this month is no exception, is to have one 
more patron than last month. So if you're not already supporting us, you're not already a member, there's lots of cool perks in there. Get in at patreon.com slash DTNS and become one of the people that pushes us over the line. Speaking of people who contribute to our show, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2130 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We will be back sort of in a way tomorrow <laughs> uh, with the predictions results show. Talk to you then. <laughs> this show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Very slick, Tom at frogpants.com. The Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>